I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, connections between the tobacco and ultra-processed food industries uh, as a case study in um, thinking through how we might do a more integrated approach to industry um, documents research and industry research in general. And I want to start by kind of speaking to that broader issue. Um, I'm a sociologist and I, I, I think in terms of systems, I'm a boundary spanner because of that. I think in terms of interconnections rather than isolated variables. So um, it's frustrating to me that we spend so much time kind of working in silos. I like to call them risk factor silos. You work on tobacco, I work on food, you work on chemicals, I work on alcohol, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, when in fact, um, you know, even WHO acknowledges the, uh, that there are multiple risk factors for chronic disease and um, increasingly, we're starting to unpack, and I th think Rob Lustig here a lot for helping me to kind of understand how all of these different risk factors, whether it's alcohol, chemicals, endocrine disruptors, and so forth, really um, pack a punch when they uh, come into our bodies, and there's very little integrative science to really understand uh, more than just understanding the mechanism. So you take something like the gut, and probably all of the um, issues we're talking about today are, are concerns for the gut, whether it's, you know, I was just noticing in this conversation about chemicals, there was no discussion of, and I'm not cr criticizing it because it was a really great discussion, but, but there was no discussion of the chemicals that come to us through food. And, uh, and yet, uh, you know, there's a lot of concern right now, for example, with ultra-processed foods in how um, emulsifiers that are in a lot of these uh, products might be leading to leaky gut. And uh, that's just the gut, one mechanism. Tobacco um, smoking can lead to inflammation, as does alcohol, oxidative stress, and so forth. So you have a lot of common mechanisms driven by the risk factors that we're concerned about today. Um, the funding structures, and I know there's some f foundation folks in the room, the funders don't help us currently, they make it worse, uh, they drive us into, into uh, silos. Um, if it, you know, it's, it's weird to be working on addiction issues, uh, thinking about food and sending your stuff, do I send it to NIDDK, do I send it to NHLIB, where the heart people are, or do I send it to NIDA, where the people will get understand addiction. And so there's a real problem for a lot of us in, um, aside from the concerns that funders may have about the political nature of what we do, uh, to be um, thinking about in a more integrative way about how all of these things together is causing uh, problems. I'll get you at the end. Um, that goes to environmental health sure. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of um, uh, siloing that goes on, and, th and this is something that as a, concerns me. So as a sociologist, um, I was trained in economic and uh, organizational sociology to think about corporations um, from the standpoint of, uh, in the sociology of markets, what we call field theory. And the idea um, of field theory is that an in industry or a market is really a uh, an aggregation of a lot of independent actors, big and small, and they're signaling to one another. There's shared culture, there's interdependency. Um, think about a social network, only one of, of corporations rather than individual humans, uh, where we, we share a lot of understandings, common understandings. Antitrust, for example, is an underpinning of markets, and in order to even navigate in a market, you need to understand how antitrust works. So it's an infrastructure within markets that um, drives corporations to look like one another, act like one another, and to respect a common set of rules. Um, so when you really step back and look at um, uh, what we do here um, from the perspective of field theory, 
And thinking about cross-industry ties, you very quickly start thinking about the nature of interdependency in um, corporate behavior. So we, many of us, you know, I've studied Coca-Cola and, and Pepsi, and they are, you know, for the 20th century, they were market rivals, and we think of them as competitors. But in fact, most of, I don't ever actually inter, interface or really deal with Coke and Pepsi. I deal with the American Beverage Association, and they co cooperate and collaborate to keep that organization going. So right there's an example of how we could be thinking about this stuff as competitive, com about markets as competitive, but actually there's a lot of underlying interdependency and collaboration and cooperation that goes on. And field theory helps us understand how this all works. Same with um, big uh, cultural assumptions that drive market behavior, such as shareholder value. Now, now that is a, a creature of the last 30 years. It's a, it's a trend, it's a, a cultural fad if you want to have, have it. It's driving a lot of corporate behavior, but it's not the only way to organize markets. And yet it's a very destructive way right now to be organizing markets. So how it was that we um, all came to agree that um, the bottom line and shareholders are all that matter in corporate behavior, that is something that can change. And, and so there's a lot of insights that come from uh, thinking this way. So I came up with this kind of, this is just an initial scheme of different ways that industries work together, cooperate together. Uh, tight and loose coupling are, are, are themes from network theory. Tightly coupled things are very closely interdependent. Loosely coupled are less so. So you can align industries across these tight and loose coupling types of relationships. And so at the very loosest level, you might have just or, uh, industries like all of the ones we're talking about today that are just kind of aligned uh, when it comes to campaign finance laws and things like that. They're just structurally aligned. They, they share interests and so they collaborate in that way. And you can go all the way up to firm co-ownership, which is the most tightly coupled arrangement where um, industries actually own parts of other industries. What I'll be talking about sort of happens between 1969 and 2008. By 2008, most of the big American corporations, tobacco companies, had spun off their food subsidiaries. But during the period that I'll be talking about, um, Philip Morris owned the largest food corporation in the world. It created it. Uh, it bought General Foods in uh, 1984. It then bought Kraft, merged them into Kraft General Foods, and it was the largest food company in the world. Uh, and it was owned by a tobacco company. Uh, they also owned Heineken and, and, or Miller at the time, Philip Morris. Um, I'm just gonna give a couple of just high level points from what we've um, uncovered about these relationships, but the key thing here is why does firm co-ownership, tightly coupled relationships between industries, why does it matter for us? We care about public health. It matters because in, this, in the case of tight coupling, it allows one industry to share with another industry what it knows, and specifically what it knows about making products more harmful. Uh, in this case, both at the product development um, stage, making products more hyperpalatable, and then at the marketing stage, making them e more easily marketed to, to vulnerable populations of children and ethnic minority groups. So just um, briefly, here's a, 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 a some examples of um, food brands that are still alive and kicking today that were owned for significant amounts of time by um, tobacco companies in America. I'll point out Lunchables, which just made the news around um, the dietary guidelines debate. Lunchables um, is in fact um, now um, authorized on the National School Lunch Program. It was invented during this period when, uh, by Kraft when um, Philip Morris owned um, Kraft, 
And uh, the only way we know about this, by the way, is because of the industry documents archive. We still don't know how many food documents are in the tobacco archive. Uh, we've accessed hundreds of thousands of them because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Philip Morris owned Kraft for, you know, 20 years. And so there, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of um, time to share uh, tips on how to um, uh, make products. Um, so starting with the, the origin story of this is, is uh, R.J. Reynolds back in 1969 uh, was the first tobacco company that we know of, could have been others, but we haven't studied them yet, uh, that moved into the food industry. And Kim Nguyen, my colleague, uh, spent about a year in the archive, hundreds of thousands of documents, trying to figure out why the hell would, would uh, RJR buy uh, um, a, a food company. And the answer was chemicals. <laughs> what we were just talking about, chemicals. Chemical colors and flavors. And in fact, um, they, wanted a, they bought Hawaiian Pacific, which had one product, Hawaiian Punch. And um, this is 1968. And um, the, the chemist running their product development division their, their, um, suggested that uh, there was an oligosaccharide that uh, he thought uh, the uh, Hawaiian Pacific owned the patent on that he knew was going to be a big deal for the food industry, and they wanted the patent. Uh, as it turns out, the colors and flavors weave their way through this whole story and are a very important research issue that this partnership needs to tackle. Um, here's a document from the archive. Uh, why would, uh, this is 62, and this is the actual document from the chemist who was, was thinking this way. Uh, and this is the mindset, right? It's very important to get inside their heads and understand that it's easy to characterize a tobacco company as merely a tobacco company. In the broader and less restricting sense, it's in the flavor business. And <laughs> many flavors in tobacco could be useful in food. So why don't we try that? And that's precisely what RJR did. By 1969, it had taken a product that before they owned it was a cocktail mixer for 50s housewives to uh, mix up with some vodka and had turned it into a beverage exclusively being marketed to children. Um, and so this is where we get the Hawaiian punch that's still marketed today. They, they put, punch, punchy was, came with the, with the brand, but only by about a year. Um, so a lot of people ask the question, well, is Joe Camel and punchy, are they the, of the same uh, family origins, so to speak? <laughs> but the strategy is broader, right? Uh, the strategy is, is, is one of um, taking a cartoon character and slapping it on a consumer brand with a lot of colors and flavors in it to attract children to it. And that is precisely what they did. Um, the other uh, innovation with Hawaiian Punch and under RJR was to uh, create a brand, a branding, um, child-focused branding, again, something they knew very well how to do with Camel cigarettes already and eventually got regulated away, uh, but to do toys and giveaways and, and cartoon characters. And they innovated the, the uh, they brought over from uh, the aseptic box that, um, and there's a lot in the, in, the, in the documents about how it's the size of a hand. They were getting inside of children's he heads and understanding children like autonomy and power. Uh, they're small, we're big, they like to feel big, and so the idea of the child being able to put their own straw in the, in the, in run around with it, these were all very intentionally designed innovations that trans enjoyable experience, as is putting sugar in the cigarette to create a little crunchy feeling in your lungs when you inhale. And all of these things are very carefully designed to make the consumer products more palatable and desirable to consumers. 
Uh, there's a lot to say here, I can't get into all of it, um, but many people in this room who really know tobacco deeply, like Pam, uh, will see all over this. Again, drawing these connections, it's about consumer products writ large, not so much whether it's a food product or a tobacco product. F soft drinks like cigarettes and beer. And that's the, 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 um, the innovative mind uh, at play there in terms of thinking more broadly about, hey, we, we already know how to make things that people want to buy. Let's expand our product lines into these other areas. There were other reasons why Philip Morris, they were starting to come under the gun with, uh, in the lead up to the master settlement agreement. And so there were all manner of reasons why they might wanna put some politically more palatable cover by selling craft foods as opposed to tobacco and so forth. The strategy worked for them on multiple levels, which of course is exactly what good CEOs know how to do create strategy that is um, ticking off multiple boxes for the company. Um, once again, colors and flavors come back into play. Cool, this on the left is the before picture, five, five colors of Kool-Aid. They bought it when they bought, um, when they created Kraft General Foods, they already had Kool-Aid in the product line, but it was being more marketed to parents rather than children. Of course, Philip Morris quickly figured out you got to haul those kids into the focus groups and figure out that the white boys like blue color and the, you know, it goes on and on. Uh, different color, different cartoon mascot for every color and flavor variety of, um, of um, Kool-Aid. A lot going on here in terms of the tobacco strategy being applied to food in terms of market segmentation, line extension, and so forth. Uh, but once again, the idea here is that the co-ownership, that tightly coupled relationship al over many years, allowed one industry to train and educate the other industry in how to make things that are more marketable and ultimately more harmful to health, uh, both through marketing and through product development. Uh, the uh, Kool-Aid Wacky, uh, Wacky Wild Warehouse was a, a Philip Morris um, and, and, and Kool-Aid uh, marketing scheme to target children. It was, and this is a case of direct um, sharing of, of, of innovations. Uh, this marketing strategy actually started out in the Marlboro line of cigarettes, the Marlboro Country Store, which was a, mar uh, a marketing and branding scheme, uh, was directly applied, this is a quote out of the archive, uh, directly applied to um, Kool-Aid brand to target market children. Uh, and other, another uh, wrinkle in the shared uh, marketing technology, this is a document um, from Kraft in the late 90s, and it's essentially what Kraft did was it's at a certain point they owned, uh, uh, they owned Miller Beer, they owned food, and they owned tobacco, and they figured out that they could integrate their marketing across all three product divisions. Um, and, and so they had these f the fully integrated marketing um, uh, project was was designed to target ethnic minority groups and you'll see here if you ever for those the researchers in the room you know the the political corporate political activities paradigm and so forth it's basically the the whole th model is right here in this document uh, you know, we like to carve this stuff up and say, oh, they do sponsorships and they do marketing and they do this and they do that. It's all right here in the document. Nobody needed a social scientist to come up with that typology, crafted it for us. So implications. Um, I want to start this, um, Kevin Hall at NIDDK uh, did a, a, a really impactful clinical trial um, a, a couple of years ago, and what he showed was that when people eat a diet um, exclusively of processed foods, they're allowed to eat as much as they want, um, but only of processed foods or non-processed foods in the control condition, um, people will eat on average about 500 calories per day more 
than if they're eating a minimally or an unprocessed food diet. So that opened up a can of worms for all of us working in the food space. And the question really is why? What is it? What's going on? The, by the way, ultra-processed foods are about 68% of the U.S. food supply. So this is what most people eat on a regular basis. And you have to go out of your way and really work hard to not eat ultra-processed foods. And so the question that everyone is asking is, why would it be? Like, what's going on with these foods? Is it that the mi gut microbiota um, eat up the extra calories in, in the healthy diet or the unprocessed diet? Is it... Um, and one question that, that gets asked is, well, maybe the um, ultra-processed foods are designed to be more hyperpalatable and make people eat more because they're, they're fun to eat or they don't make you full or they're tasty um, or they're colorful. Um, and of course, that's what the chemicals, many of the chemicals are there for pre preservatives, but some of them are in, the, in, in these foods to make, make them more desirable to consumers, especially children. And so this is a question that's really um, gained some traction. And um, the, the, a colleague of mine who I, a, and collaborator, Tara Fazzino, who's at the University of Kansas, um, actually um, read some of our papers. This is how I came to start working with Tara. She called me up one day and said, hey, you know, we read your papers on tobacco-owned food brands, and I, I have a, I've developed a classification for hyperpalatability of foods. And uh, long story short, she, uh, she and a team of her, her folks uh, coded uh, the entire USDA branded foods database, which is about two million food products, and, and uh, to figure out were the tobacco-owned food brands different from uh, the standard ultra-processed foods in our food supply. And what they found is that they're up to 80% more likely to be hyperpalatable. So this now raises, uh, this starts to get us closer to a answering these questions about what is going on with the ultra processed foods that makes people eat more. Uh, by the way, they also eat faster. Uh, they, there are some uh, biomarker changes that happen on the ultra processed food diet. So it's a really interesting and sticky problem to unpack. And of course the chemicals are another question. Is it the chemicals in the ultra-processed foods that are somehow uh, changing the way people eat? Um, but this really, really brought us to the point of asking, okay, the tobacco-owned food brands, and this is while they were owned by tobacco companies. And what's really interesting about what Tara did is she studied the period when the tobacco companies owned the foods, and then she studied what's going on with our current food supply. And what she found was that the rest of the food industry uh, basically came up to match over time into the present, match the degree of hyperpalatability in the, re in the tobacco owned food brands. So that now everything in the whole industry is uh, hyperpalatable, uh, similar to the tobacco uh, brands. And uh, that makes a ton of sense, by the way, from the standpoint of the sociology of markets and field theory, because the whole point of having a market is we all watch each other and try to copy each other and get ahead that way. Um, so uh, here are a few next steps, I think, um, for uh, the, our partnership and, and moving forward. One thing we're doing is, you know, these food databases are so huge and we've actually recently gained access to a, uh, through a, a, a somewhat of a do-gooder in the food industry, a proprietary data set that provides uh, a different vantage point on the whole food supply. And, uh, you know, this is a lot of work for grad students to code. Uh, so we've been using artificial intelligence in a partnership with the UC San Diego supercomputer center to actually unpack what's going on in the in the food supply in a more efficient way and which brands and which companies are creating more hyperpalatable foods and uh, one of the findings uh, is some of these product lines you know most of what they create uh, this first top one is Frito-Lay and 90% uh, of what it's making is hyperpalatable and um, so you're, you're looking at potentially uh, identifying the companies that really may need to be, uh, have their business practices looked into more carefully and by regulators. Um, a second line of uh, research in this area 
is to really unpack in the documents what's going on with the product development divisions. We've only looked so far in the marketing divisions and a, a sort of um, a whistleblower who doesn't really want to come to, to uh, be, be called out and, and so forth, but has talked to us. Um, has suggested that maybe there wasn't so much stuff going on in the bowels of Kraft General Foods uh, in the product development, that it was a whole different campus and maybe the Philip Morris executives weren't over there telling them how to make, uh, you know, how to reformulate. Um, so there's a real need to dive into those hundreds of thousands of documents in the product development line and we're doing this currently to try to figure out what what information was shared, not just about how to market to children in ethnic minority groups, but how to actually formulate things and, and what did the food companies' uh, subsidiaries learn at the time from the tobacco companies. And then finally, there's a real need to track the chemical additives across food and tobacco products. The very same chemicals that uh, Dean mentioned menthol, um, many of the chemicals that we are interested in because they were um, introduced into s sugar sweetened beverages and so forth, but Kool-Aid and, and Hawaiian Punch, actually made their way back into, into tobacco products and e-cigarettes. And there's a very, very thin um, evidence base of few toxicology labs who have taken the stuff in those vape pods and tried to unpack what's in there. There are thousands of chemicals. And there are really big, important questions about who's regulating this stuff. Is this approved for ingestion? Is it approved for inhalation? And so forth. And so again, going back to the AI strategy, being able to subject the FEMA, which is the trade organization for the chemical additives people, uh, they have a whole flavor library and being able to go in there and uh, handle all of these many, many chemicals that are in our food in, a, in an efficient way um, from a research standpoint is a, is a very um, important next step. Um, so just to conclude, big high level points. Uh, the health harming industries we care about, we think of them as competitors. They are very cooperative when it, when, and have very aligned interests in some ways. So a lot of us step back and we say, oh, that's the tobacco playbook or sugar's the new tobacco. And we're, we continuously are mystified that these companies act the same. Uh, and, you know, they're on the same markets, they're, they're doing the same stuff, so of course they behave the same, they copy each other. And we should, you know, step back and start asking the question, how do they relate to one another? Where are they on this spectrum? How coupled are they? And what are the mechanisms by which they share information and expertise? Uh, secondly, cross-industry collaborations can result in more harmful products. This is just one example, and I encourage you as the day goes forward to think about that as you um, to hear about cross-industry ties. How is it that uh, these collaborations are actually producing uh, products that otherwise would not be on the market killing people? And then finally, uh, we need, they collaborate, as Tracy pointed out, and we should too. Thank you.